Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Real People, a podcast that highlights some amazing guests who are doing important work to make it possible for people to thrive and be their best, both at work and in the broader realm of living life to its fullest. I'm Harold Hillman, Managing Director of Sigmoid Curve Consulting Group based in Auckland, New Zealand. I am particularly honored today to host David Marquette, who is a former, former naval nuclear submarine commander who defied the conventional practice of command and control when he was assigned to lead one of the worst performing submarines in the U.S. Naval Fleet. Uh, Captain Marquette had trained for nearly a year to command a different vessel, but the plan changed suddenly with very little notice, and he found himself face to face with the challenge of leading without a playbook. Newly aboard the USS Santa Fe, he experimented with an approach fundamentally different from the leader-follower model, which we often associate with the captain giving orders and everyone else following those orders, sometimes blindly. With no prescribed playbook, Captain Marquette tried an approach that he calls intent-based leadership, which changed the entire dynamic on the submarine. Long story short, the USS Santa Fe went from worst in fleet to first in fleet setting record benchmarks for performance on all metrics, including staff engagement, retention, and promotion. It's from that experience that David wrote the global best-selling book, Turn the Ship Around, a true story of turning followers into leaders. Fortune Magazine called the book the best how-to manual anywhere for managers on delegating, training, and driving flawless execution. USA Today described it as one of the 12 best business books of all time. In addition to this bestseller and other books, Dave is a globally renowned keynote speaker, having presented in over 30 countries and counting. He is a contributor to Forbes magazine and an adjunct professor at Columbia University in New York. David Marquette, welcome to Real People. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Harold, for having me on your show. And welcome, all Real People listeners out there. Now, we had a chance yesterday to speak briefly just to put some, get some context on the podcast and where we might go in conversation. And you told me that you had visited New Zealand before on vacation. That was how many years ago? Yeah, I've been, on the, uh, been there a couple of times. I did a little work with the New Zealand Navy. And then uh, just last fall, I was on vacation there, holiday with my uh, wife on a cruise. Yeah, not fantastic. It is. It is. It's great to have you back virtually. Yeah. <laughs> with a New Zealand audience, and I wanted to ask you first off: um, Do you miss the military? You. It was. It was your life for a what thirty years of your life. Yeah. So. I don't think I do, to be honest with you. I uh, I feel like that was a chapter, and that was great, uh, but I'm in a new chapter. There are some f- particular aspects I missed. There was a clear sense of camaraderie and, and teaming yes. that was uh, almost magic in some cases. But it's a tough, it's a young man's game. It's a tough game. A young man or woman's game, and you don't you don't sleep right, you don't eat eat right. It takes a, a toll on your body. So I, I'm not sure I miss it. I think I'm good with where. I, where <laughs> <laughs> I I mentioned to you yesterday that I too was in the military. I was a an Air Force officer, and having yeah. served just two tours. And when I joined the corporate world, I, I remember there being sort of a rigid stereotype of what leadership must be like in the military. And right. I thought that people defined it. I, I actually um, felt from my military career that I had learned um, some things around best practice, particularly to your point around that whole notion of teaming. But there is a bit of a narrow view of what leadership perhaps looks like within the military. Right. And uh, what I run into is uh, this uh, simplistic, well, it's easy to be a leader. Just order people around. They have to do it, right? That's it really right. kind of goes to the crux of, of what uh, I learned, which was you can order people around. And by the way, I don't really think it's all that different in the corporate world based on my experience now with a bunch of companies. But I agree. The, um, the helpful thing in the military is you know the pecking order very clearly because we're all That's wearing right. on our 
skirts. <laughs> but uh, so see the, see the idea. Well, you can order people around. Well, you can, but all you get when you do that is compliance, and you get sort of the physical manifestations of the work. What you don't That's get right. is full commitment. You don't get the discretionary. You don't get the passion. You don't get full thinking, and you have no idea if someone is is contributing half their brain or, or or they're all in. You just can't tell from the outside, and people can fake it pretty well. So the idea is, you want to create an environment where you actually don't need to tell anyone anything. That that they have such a clear sense of purpose and what the team is trying to do, and they yes. have the tactical skills to do it. That they lean into you, and they feel safe enough. This is the key. This is what I missed for a long time. It's about yes. safety. Too many times I felt my job was to add stress to my team. I toughen them up until we went into right. combat or whatever. They would be, you know, ready for it. But all I'm really With doing, yeah, is is suppressing their uh, ability to really stretch and reach out and say what they think, and it's not helpful. Under that leader follower model, there's the, uh, the the sort of a fundamental underpinning of fear, isn't there? Yeah, it's, it's fundament, fundamentally coercive because in the leader follower model, we separate the world into one group of people. I call them the deciders, the thinkers, the decision yes. makers. And a different group of people are the doers. And we have different codes and cultural signals they wear different uniforms that were lab coats right. versus overalls and so 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 when we separate the people who are making the decisions from the people who are executing them there yes. has to be there just has to be an element of coercion because we have to we have to get the deciders have to get the doers to do stuff that they didn't fundamentally decide and i think this That's is one right. of the fundamental ch changes today is we're trying, most organizations, they, they don't always say it this way, but every organization I talk to, whether they use the word empowerment or whatnot, is they're, what they're trying to do is get the people who are doing the work to also be able to make decisions about the work. That's right. So as you, as, yeah. Go ahead, David. No, I'm just saying, I just, I just, whatever they call it, I see this as such a fundamental change. Definitely. I, as you were talking, I was thinking about my father who, um, worked in the in the 50s and 60s. He actually worked at the um, the Navy Yard in um, Washington D.C. Huh. And he was a um, and he repaired elevators. And he huh. referred to himself when he went off to work. He referred referred to himself as a pair of hands. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's how we grew up. And my father would just say, "I'm a pair of hands." <laughs> exactly. He was hired, and and that's why we we. I, w I was at a software company not that long ago speaking, and I was speaking at their, what did they call it? Their all hands meeting. No. And like, but, but the language, it, you know, it's like, well, that seems pretty harmless. Like, what's the difference? It's the term we use. But there's so yeah. many examples we, of our language being rooted in this industrial age. Uh, structure that I, that I think it basically it, it holds us back. It's like an anchor holding us to the past. We have to cast off that language. Do you think that we have learned more in business over the last 20 years with the advent of emotional intelligence, um, with more empirical data that really suggests that we have to unleash this thing called engagement and empowerment in people? Has, have things shifted? Well, we've certainly learned a lot. Number one, we learned about, we've learned, for example, uh, that the brain is maintains its elasticity past childhood. And so the, yes. so you can learn and grow all your life. Oh my gosh, isn't that great news? But this education system is designed where you're going to get schooled for 22 years and then you're going to do, think, then do. And uh, so we need more thinking uh, interruptions throughout our life. We've learned about the biases. We, we, we tended for a long time to think of ourselves as purely rational, but we know when we, we phrase the exact same choice two different ways, people yes. make, people make uh, as a population, 
we veer one way when we ask it one way, and we veer a different way. We ask it a, a different way, even though mathematically it's the exact same. And so yes. we're learning so many things about about humans. Uh, but I do see a gap between the academic world and the practitioners. Say more. Well, uh, the the academic world, their problem is the language that they use is, uh, is arcane and obscure. And you keep, like, what is this person uh, really trying to say with this study? And yes. uh, the practitioners, so, so the practitioners are just like, I don't really care as long as it works. But That's I right. Think, I think there's a lot to be gained um, in this sort of translation mode. And there's some authors who are really good at translating the arcane language of the academicians into practical speak for uh, CEOs and business leaders. Yeah, the um, the essence of engagement. I, I re remember when in the, when this whole notion of, of employee or staff engagement um, became prominent. Certainly here in New Zealand, within the last decade or so, it's just it's everything. So there is a the the idea that you can retain people. They're more engaged, and you can retain them. Um, and um, and get the best out of them if you go to a different realm of of uh, leadership. Can you say more about um, intent based leadership? Yeah. So uh, we call our program intent based leadership because this word intent is so important to us. And I'm really trying to draw a distinction from what is de facto the standard way of operating. The standard most other organizations would be called um either task and respond so the if you just think about like what's the primary communication it's people up high tasking other people and the other people reporting task and yes. report or it's get permission get permission wait for permission convince someone to and so an intent based leadership does is turns it on its head and said you have permission you have yes. here's your obligation though you have to announce ahead of time what you're going to do publicly you use the word intent that's a special word that means i'm going to do this uh, unless someone stops me either through authority or sure. i learn from a peer that it's not a good idea so i intend to submerge the ship i intend to launch the product on time i intend to do more testing whatever it happens to be and yes. the, the thing is, what you're doing is you're also upending the way feedback works. Most feedback happens, it's feedback because it's on what you did. And, yes. and so people then react sort of like it stings, it's criticism. And what we're doing is we're saying, you know what? You're going to invite feedback before you even do the thing. You're going to invite different thinking, different yes. perspectives. And so you say, hey, I intend to do this. What does everyone think ahead of time? And, and, yes. and gosh, does that make it makes better decisions? And it puts us in this mode of inviting feedback. Yes. Not, not learning how to give feedback, but learning how to invite feedback. And so we how to actually it. receive it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine with then starting a conversation rather than saying, may I have permission to do um, the, conversa the conversation starts with, I intend to do. And even as I say those words, I can viscerally feel a different sense of accountability. And right. Ownership. You own it. You own it. So here's our thing. Uh, so first of all, this is very complicated. This, 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 here's how complicated it is. Every time you get in the car and you use your turn signal, that's an intent statement. That's exactly as complicated as this is. You're say telling the people that. around. <laughs> I like that. But but here's the deal. Employee engagement is very simple. People like to make it complicated. There's one step. Give your people the ability to make decisions. And once you do that, they will be engaged. Everything else, all this other stuff that's wrapped around employee engagement is simply window dressing for organizations that haven't fundamentally given their people decision making. And they're trying to yes. make up for it for whatever else, these, whatever these other sort of tricks. Uh, are so in, what intent does is you can't hide when you say well i intend to launch the product on time and the product launch doesn't go well you can't say oh well that wasn't my idea that's you right own it. 
right? And that's, that's so that right. creates better responsibility. People ask me, well, how do you hold people accountable? I say, what are you talking about? Well, because accountability is, is it's, a, it's a structure from when I told you what, I, here's what accountability is. I tell you what to do. I tell you how many resources you have. I tell you when you need to do it by and probably how to do it. And then when it doesn't come out right, I, quote, hold you accountable. Right? That's right. Right. So, That's right. so in intent-based leadership, you don't need to hold people accountable because they're self-accountable because they know they made the decision. The team holds themselves accountable. That's so right. step one, employee engagement. Step one, give people the ability to make decisions. Step two, you're done. That is a um, that would be real threatening to someone still stuck in that um, leader follower model where the leader is the one who does the thinking and controls everything. Um, you've got to have a, a fairly comfortable relationship with vulnerability to um, really keep people engaged and give them um, control over their own decisions and those types of things. You've got to be reasonably comfortable letting go, don't you? Yeah, you do. But so, Harold, so here's the thing. All your listeners can practice this. This is our favorite uh, opening activity. And by the way, leadership is learned through activities. It's not learned through um, rumination and, and study. It's learned by practicing. So so here's what yes. you do. The, the next forever, when you go out to a restaurant, see if you can get the, the server to choose your dinner for you. And, and and what happens here is you have to give up control to that person. We like to be in charge. We like to say, well, I'll pick my dinner. I don't want to get a bath. I don't want to get something I don't like. I don't want to get something out of my comfort zone. So I'm going to pick. And what I want you to do is try and widen the aperture as much as possible. You know, if you have food restrictions, obviously you were going to convey that or allergies. But you say, right. you know, as, long, as long as it's not shellfish, I'm good. You pick yes. and, and, I, and surprise me. Don't play it safe. So two, two things are going to happen. One, you have you will live with a certain degree of anxiety. And I want you to understand how that feels. Yes. And, and, and number two is through a discussion and a connection. Not through coercion, but with, through a connection with this person. That you have to make it safe for them to make this, this decision for you. This is exactly yeah. how I felt as a submarine captain. It's exactly what everyone can practice. And then you go to work and then you know, oh, this is the right feeling. This is and the right feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still sticking with that example that you gave of the restaurant. And I'm picturing um, a couple of things. You're absolutely right. There is a certain degree. If you give that, that decision to the waiter or waitress, um, you would feel sort of that anxiety in terms of, well, there's some uncertainty here. But I'm also imagining that there's just a greater degree of ownership on the part of the waiter and the waitress um, yeah. in terms of, of what they bring you, how they bring it to you, their focus. Yeah. That's a great yeah. example, David. Yeah, and, and Harold, we've got, uh, we take executive teams, we have them do them as pre-homework, and then they come back and we tell stories. We've heard great stories. People say, well, I never would have ordered it, but I've had some really interesting things that have risked my life. Uh, yeah. the, I, I, you know, I noticed that the waiter paid more attention to us, even with the water, because we were their group. Like, they were in. And then yeah. on the other hand, so people say, I couldn't, like, we couldn't get them the person to pick. McDonald's, that's a challenge. So we couldn't get them to pick. Why? Well, because we didn't make it safe enough. And, and then that's a skill you can practice. You didn't read the language. You just jumped into it. Did you give them a choice? Did you just give them a con contact? Or did you just say, oh, I need you to do this for me? Did you basically try to order them? That's not going to work. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this is um, it's super fun. And then notice, like, so for me, I can tell you, I try this. Uh, you know, I try to, of course, I try have to do it a lot because we're eating our own dog food. And I have to <laughs> But, but, you know, I don't do it every time. I, did, I was in Korea. I was, yes. And it's d different food. I was with a big group. It would have taken some time. It's a different language. Blah, blah, blah. And 
uh, it was the end of a long day, whatever. But you need to yes. notice these things in yourself. So you can't always be the delegator that you want to be. You can't always be the empowering leader you want to be. You want to be that, but you should notice when I'm tired, when I'm stressed out, when I'm in a strange environment, it's going to be harder. And I want you to it's, notice that about yourself. Absolutely. The um, we in, in our pre-call yesterday, we talked a bit about vulnerability. And um, my sense that certainly over the last two decades or so, that has begun to shift from being, whereas two decades ago, vulnerability, I think, was perceived as a vice. Um, in 2019, more and more people are seeing it as a virtue um, in terms of, of connection. Um, and probably my, my sense is that vulnerability would be fundamental under the intent-based leadership. You've really got to be okay with not having all the answers, not being the best, most perfect person in the room. Yeah, hey, I like having the answers, and I like it when, when leaders have the answers, and I like it when the people who work for me have the answers. But just because you have the answer or you think you have the answer doesn't mean you have to blurt it out. And yes. it's... It's easy, like when we know we don't have the answer, uh, I, most people aren't going to fake it. They say, hey, I'm not sure. Let's, let's work on this together. It's when we think we have the answer that we still need to say, hey, why don't you guys go, go think about it and not tell me what you would do. Tell me what you would do if I weren't here. Tell me what you, what you would do if you had to make, make a decision without me. And, and see their thinking. Get into their thinking. Yes. Uh, because now you're developing leaders. Otherwise, you're just getting production done, which may be necessary sometimes. But but if you never are, step back and do the developing leaders, you're never going to get out of that. I'm I'm the production. It, in other words, you want to build a decision making factory as opposed to just a bunch of people who execute your decisions. That's right. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I was as you were talking, I was extrapolating back to your. USS Santa Fe experience where, in fact, you probably, at least initially, didn't have all the answers. You really did rely on, you had to, to sort of spark the thinking amongst the uh, crew, didn't you? Yeah, and so people, people say to me, oh, you must have had a lot of courage to do it. I said, no, it was fear and panic, plus I didn't know the answer. But, but here's the thing, Harold. One of the reasons, because I, because I was comfortable saying, I don't know. I learned the shift, and I, you know, by by year two, by year three, I felt yeah, I think I probably got the answers down pretty well. But I'd seen how powerful it was not giving my team the, the easy answer all right away. That yes. So so the idea is know the answer, but you choose when and how and how quickly uh, you're going to break 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 the logjam with your team. Let them work on it. Let them do their push-ups. Let them do their leadership training. You don't need to do leadership it, training. This, this yeah. is a huge mistake. Uh, organizations yes. have all these development programs. You don't need that. The reason they do that is because they're not embedding it into their structure. All you need to do yes. is every time there's a decision, say, okay, let's talk about this. What would you guys do? That's your leadership program. That is exactly. Yeah, I just, I just a bunch of leadership consultants just got fired. Oh, well. It's in the conversation. You're really emphasizing that the learning and the real yeah. uh, development is in the conversation. It's not, you know, sit, sit down and actually have some conversation about what, what happened. Right? <laughs> yeah. Now, David, what, what, what was the, how long did it take on the USF Santa Fe for the, crew to really lock in around a different paradigm of leadership. It, there was palpable change within a day. Within and, a day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but, but you got to remember, a submarine, take 130 people and cram them into this tiny spot and they can't leave. They're all bumping into each other. And so person A talks to person B, who talks to person C and D, who talks to person E and F. And so it, it's a very closely coupled system from yes. the human element, and, and word travels quickly. So um, within six months, I kind of feel like within six months, we were way, we were well past the tipping point, and it would have been hard to go back. And with companies, um, 
we've seen, I mean, you can probably hear change at the end of a week. You, yes. you, it'll start sounding different in the office because our, our, our approach is a very language based approach. If people start coming up and saying, I intend to, or in emails, hey, I, you know, next, next week at noon, I intend to, blah, blah, blah. Here's my thinking, da, da, da. Here's why I think it's the right thing to do. Here's why I think it's, it's safe and correct. If anyone has any objections, you got until midnight Friday. <laughs> Right. And yes. these things start coming out and you will sense a difference. We talked when when we spoke yesterday, um, we were talking about the different experience from when you were on the USS Will Rogers, where you also attempted the same approach, but you were um, not yet a captain. You weren't yet a commander. Um, yeah. I think it helps. I think we, we talked yesterday about the fact that certainly at the helm, of the ship um, or the CEO, the executive team, it helps if, in fact, they are living the talk. Oh yeah, I I think it's really hard. I mean, some some days I think to myself, well, I don't think you can do it if if the CEO or the the and managing director is not on board. Um, but then I would lose a bunch of business because I do have yes. people senior in the organization who are like, I'm the senior vice president of operations and I want to do this. And so we, we do have pretty good examples where, where the head of operations or the head of IT or te technology product development has been able to, well, in one case, the head, for example, the head of uh, the uh, phone answering, the customer service center made an unbelievable yes. change but it is hard once you get to the rest of the organization if they're not on board if if the top people are on board again they don't need to do any training they just need to practice they just need to live the practice and and it'll cascade out naturally yeah it makes it uh, makes it much uh, make makes it much easier um, you all, you did some amazing things on um, USS Santa Fe in a um, in a relatively short spectrum of time, and um, did that impact on naval training um, at all at a, at a broader scope in terms of this paradigm shift from <laughs> away from traditional leader follower? Yeah, well, so so yes and no. The Navy put the book on the reading list. You go on any submarine, you'll hear them say, "I intend to." Uh, because the real, what happened was 10 of my officers became, uh, over the next several years, got promoted, became submarine captains. So they sort of carried it with them. They, they carried the virus with, with them. Yes. But, but I, I ended up, um, so I got invited to go to the Naval Academy and talk to the wizards of leadership there. Yes. And um, so I said, they, 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 I, someone, would, someone told them they had to talk to me, this kind of a thing. Yes. So, so this is going to come out sounding really snotty, and I apologize. But so I, I walk in. There is three professors, academics. And they're sitting on one side of a table, and there's a, like this little chair for me on the other side of the table. <laughs> right. And I sit down. They're sitting right. there. With their, their arms crossed, and their professorial yes. looks, and their 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 glasses down around their noses, and they kind of look over at me. And one of them says, "So, how can we help you?" <laughs> I, like, no. oh, I got this all wrong. I thought I was here to help you, but okay, never mind. Um, so anyway, we we talked cordially about some research that they were doing, but they weren't really interested in in yes. um, in learning anything new, which I thought was um, unfortunate because uh, I, I I just think we are all I, I I in fact I changed my bio. I kind of had this traditional bio that said, David Morco is an expert in leadership, blah, blah, blah. And I thought about it. I said, you know, I, I don't know anything, but I do yeah. know what I don't know. And, um, and so I changed it to I'm a student of leadership. And I try and remember that uh, admitting you don't know is the, is the start to learning, the start to growth, the start yeah. to getting better. And it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, now that is, I, I like that in terms of being a student versus a um, an expert. Uh, Chris Argerus, um 
um, formerly at Harvard, uh, wrote an article about how difficult it is for people um, who are in relatively senior roles to often change their thinking because they yeah. lock themselves in to that sense of no longer learning, no longer being a student and those types of things. And so I love that because what it does is it says that you are open to new ideas. Yeah, and when you ask people, say, hey, five years from now, do you think you'll be doing everything exactly the same you're doing it now? No, 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 I'm sure I'll be getting better. But then when you back it up to today and say, okay, so what are you doing? What are the things you're doing today might you want to cast away? No, 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 everything is good. <laughs> it's like, well, you can't cast away what you have today. You're going to end up in five years with attached to all the stuff you're doing now. Exactly. Exactly. And on the tail end of things, because paradigms do, they do crash and burn sometimes right, right. very quickly. Hey, look, I'm, I'm mindful of, of, um, of, of time, so I just want to shift gears a bit. You have had the opportunity to, I think, co-teach with Simon Sinek. Yeah, yeah, we taught a class at uh, Columbia together. It was it was really amazing uh, getting a chance to work with them. Yeah, I, um, you know, particularly around the whole um, notion of authenticity. We talked pre uh, earlier about engagement. There's this 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 notion of um, being attached to your why. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Sinek, of course, talks about that within the context of the golden circle, that a lot of people are, a lot of people are too focused on their what, but right. not necessarily on the why. And um, you've lived a very rich life, um, starting from childhood on. And um, how, would you how would you define your personal why? What drives you and what, what is your purpose? Um, uh, my purpose, and this kind of came about relatively from experience and personal things that happened to me. But my purpose is to uh, help leaders create better environments for the people around them uh, so that the people around them are healthier and happier because they have more control over their lives. Yes. And, and I live my purpose by uh, telling the story, uh, letting them believe that it can can happen if it can happen on a nuclear submarine maybe it can happen there by giving them maybe some words to try but fundamentally for me there's a morality to leadership that we is, is absent from a lot of conversations because we know now when you asked me about the things we learned we know yes. that when you put humans in in a toxic environment and this is really the right word there and, and we stress them we don't give them the tools they need to do their jobs they don't feel safe at work they can't be themselves they got to suppress their emotions we know it takes a toll on their health yes so leaders have the same obligation as doctors yes because we're playing with people's lives and with playing with their health but we don't we don't pay enough attention to the moral imperative behind leadership so if you're going to stand up there and say i'm going to be i'm going to be a mechanic uh i'm going to be a carpenter i'm going to be a whatever fine the, the wood the masonry the, there's no morality there but if you want to be a leader and the things you do are going to affect the lives of other human beings yeah. you better be locked into understanding the impact because you could be taking years away from people's lives yeah. and that is just yeah. an immoral thing to do especially a, well it's an immoral thing to do yeah no i love that i love the way you um phrase that i often in the in the corporate setting i often compare my experience um when, when i'm talking with groups i compare my experience from being a military officer to being a corporate executive mm -hmm. and um and i make the case that in the military uh, we were far more conscious around that moral imperative, as you um, describe it. Part of it is that we're in uniform, we're being called sir or ma'am all day long, we're being saluted. So there's a, you know, we're, there's a constant reminder that you are a leader. But um, in the corporate world, 
Um, people are just, a, you know, my sense is a bit more lackadaisical. Not necessarily, it's not front of mind in terms of the impact that your every word and action can have on the quality of life of people working for you. Right. And so this is what I really wish, because I, I can't tell you how many times, I'm sure you've heard it, that people say, well, your experience in the military, it, it sharpens your attention because people can die, you shoot the wrong missile, people die. I said, yeah, but you you treat your people the wrong way, they're going to die. It, we, you won't know for 20 or 30 years that you shorten their lives. But it's the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to your point around um, health, wellness, safety, and those types of things, people who um, are uh, own accountability are more engaged. They are healthier. They're happier. And it does exactly. make a big difference. It makes a huge yeah. difference. I, lo I love that. Um, I'll finish with this question in terms of just your, uh, again, your very impressive life. You have, you know, you exemplify drive, ambition, aspiration, those types of things. You, do you believe that uh, uh, any truth to the construct of a natural born leader? Um, have you always been a leader, even when you were six? <laughs> no, I, you know, I don't. I don't think so. First of all, I always think, I always think, uh, I play opposite, um, opposite game with myself. So if if there's a phrase like the natural born leader, what I'll do is I'll say, well, what if it's actually the opposite? What if we're actually instinctively not leaders? Yes. <laughs> and I think the when people say the natural born leader, and I say, well, pick, draw me a picture of what that person is like. Yes. What people will generally tell me is, well, they're the charismatic, outgoing, extroverted man on a horse. Uh, man who uh, boldly gives orders and directs people where to go. And I said, yeah, well, that's, that is nothing of the leadership that, that I'm interested in. And so I think we attach the word leadership. The question is leadership. Yes. What is leadership? If leadership is telling people what to do, yeah, there are people who naturally like to tell people what to do. But yeah. I don't think that's leadership. I think that's maybe yes. achievement. It's barely teamwork, and it's not leadership. Yeah. Leadership is always about other people making the lives of other people better, not some remote customer, but the people who work in your office. So, yes. so, so not locked into some stereotypical mode of this charismatic, extroverted, you know, yeah. overly strong person. Yeah, I, I loved your definition earlier. Um, leaders help create better environments for people to thrive. Yeah, I mean, extroverts can be good leaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's> possible. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, but definitely. I work hard at it. Yeah, definitely. Hey, David, thank you very much for your yeah, thanks, uh, um, hey, for your time. No, I appreciate it. I just wanted to let our listeners know that they can learn more about you, www.davidmarquette.com, also www.turntheshiparound.com. And David, you have a YouTube channel called Leadership Nudges. Is that a is that a daily or a weekly nudge? It, yeah, so it's it's weekly, but we have over 250 of them. So we've been doing it for five years, and it's a and I try and keep it to 60 to 90 seconds. It's a short video. People don't need more training. They just need reminders. And it, a lot of times it's little phrases. Don't say it this way. Say it that way. Don't say, are you sure? Ask, how sure are you? And uh, they're, they're quick. And uh, people have fun. We have uh, over 10,000 subscribers. And then you, if you're on the website, you can sign up and get the enroll. And you can get the um, weekly email. Or just go to YouTube and subscribe. But, yeah, and, and, and let me know how it works. Try stuff and uh, just make post a comment. Hey, tried it, collapsed and burned, or was brilliant, whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there is gold there. And David, thanks again. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today, and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Great, thank you, Harold, and thanks to all your all of your listeners for uh, for your time and attention today. Sure thing, sir. Take care.